Okay, so uh, today the talk is going to be given by Nathan Fury. He's an assistant professor for the Department of Biological Sciences at UNH. Um, he leads the Fish and Movement Ecology Lab, which helps to understand the motivations and consequences of animals across ecosystems, mostly focusing on fish. Uh, so he got his bachelor's degree in marine biology and environmental science at UNE and um, his master's of science degree from Texas A&M and his PhD from the University of British Columbia. And uh, now he's at UNH. So that is all I have, Nathan, if you wanna take over. Awesome, thank you so much for the introduction, Melissa. And thank you to the Great Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve for having me, giving, you, giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you today and kind of give you some insight into the research that we do here at the, the University of New Hampshire. This might be a bit of a different lecture than, than you're expecting because we won't spend our entire time um, on Great Bay and, and local ecosystems. We're actually gonna talk a fair amount about some of my work during uh, my PhD and postdoc that's continuing to this day day out in British Columbia, but then we'll work our way back closer and closer to home towards the uh, towards the end of the talk. So I hope that that's that that's all right, that we won't be focusing just solely on on local issues today. Before I begin, however, I do want to acknowledge that where I'm speaking from, from Nottingham, uh, New Hampshire, as well as the University of New Hampshire uh, is located on the Nadakana which is the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. Um, and we acknowledge and honor uh, the land and waterways that these people have stewarded through the generations. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about a lot of projects and we're gonna move pretty quickly. And hopefully it'll be evident that I solely cannot be responsible for all of this work. It would not be possible without uh, an incredible amount of collaborations. And I'm going to allude to my students at the University of New Hampshire here in a, in a second, but I work with students really all over the continent. Um, we're gonna highlight Adam Canigan's work today. He's a PhD student at the University of British Columbia. I'm fortunate to work with other academics kind of across the continent um, uh, as well. And then a really important part of our work is working with state, provincial, and, and federal scientists, uh, again, both locally as, as well as uh, abroad. And then uh, lastly, but just as important, we work with a variety of nonprofits and non-government organizations, uh, both here in the US as well as in, in Canada. And I have to thank the, the Honey Gatine First Nation uh, who allowed us access to the incredible field site that we're going to be talking about, as well as uh, local Inuit communities um, in Nunavut that gave us access to some of the field sites I'll be talking about later on as well. This here is the, the Fish and Movement Ecology Lab at the University of New Hampshire. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we don't even have a, a photo of all of the students all together because um, uh, the three students in the corners, Alia, Chloe, and, and Emily have joined us kind of um, during the, the pandemic times. But this is really, uh, these are the folks who get the research done. So I get to be up here um, with my smiling face talking about all the wonderful research, but realize uh, how incredible our graduate researchers are um, in conducting uh, this work. And then we can't do science without support, whether it's logistical or, or financial. We've really been fortunate to be funded by a variety um, and supported by a variety of means and, and groups uh, throughout the past uh, decade or so. Okay, so who am I? This, this talk is all about uh, movement ecology. And so most people consider me as a fish ecologist and I am indeed trained in fish biology, but I'm also trained as a movement ecologist. And to me, that simply means that my research tries to understand why do animals move? And then what are the consequences of those movements or variability in those movements? And so if you even think about this or as myself, someone who studied animal movements for a long time, you quickly realize that animals move for a couple of reasons. And those are to either to feed or to keep themselves from being fed upon by predators. And so my lab also does research in predator-prey interactions and trying to understand what influences uh, predation risk of, of animals. 
And this idea of predator-prey interaction is really an exchange of currency, an exchange of, of energy. Animals need energy to survive and they need them to move. And so my lab also does research in bioenergetics to try to understand what, uh, what and how you eat. How is that gonna influence your growth? How is that gonna influence your success? How is it gonna influence your behavior? And regardless of whether we're talking about movements or interactions with predator or prey or how we use, gain, or conserve energy, all of these processes are going to be affected by where on the planet that animal is, what type of habitat it is, if we're talking about a fish, what the water quality is. And so my lab also does work in the field of landscape ecology to try to understand how the sense of place influences all of these other uh, processes. However, again, I kind of consider myself first and foremost a, a movement ecologist, and this is where we're going to start our story going across the coast, going to British Columbia. And why did this kid who grew up in upstate New York want to do a PhD on the west coast of Canada so badly? And it was because I wanted to study a very singular or a very special type of, of animal movement. And that type of movement are migrations. And so migrations are just simply when we have large proportions of an animal population all moving in the same direction, moving large distances to the same place at the same time. And what's really interesting and fascinating about animal migrations is that it doesn't matter if you walk, swim, or fly. It doesn't matter if you have a backbone or not. We see large-scale migrations across the globe and across ecosystems and across types of critters. And so there's a really neat, um, I guess, desire to want to know why and, and what influences the success of these migrations. Unfortunately, regardless of whether these animals walk, swim, or fly, or what continent they're on, there's a lot of evidence to demonstrate that migratory tax are in very strong declines over the past several decades. And so there's also a really strong um, conservation-based motivation to try to understand what influences migratory animals. And so in British Columbia, probably the most iconic animal migrant is the sockeye salmon. And so the sockeye salmon is a, is a migratory fish that lives on the west coast of North America, all the way from um, Alaska down into Washington, historically down into Oregon as well. And this is a fish that is of extreme importance to uh, commercial fisheries, recreational fisheries, as well as culturally to local First Nations and Native American communities. And they're iconic because they're just huge populations as these adults migrate upstream that can be targeted by fisheries, but also as you see on the nature shows, bears and, and eagles alike. And they can be so dense in number that they just make the waters boil. And they have these incredible um, characteristics as they mature. We call these secondary sexual characteristics in biology, where they get these bright red backs and bright green heads as they work their way upstream. Unfortunately, like a lot of other migratory taxa, in British Columbia, we're not seeing positive indications uh, of health of these populations. On the y-axis here, we just have survival um, through time. And what we should be able to see is kind of starting late 1990s and in the 2000s, we're seeing declines in survival. If we extended this plot out to the last 10 years, I know it's dated, but we would see those trends continue with this past year potentially being the, the lowest on record um, in part because of a, a, a natural disaster that occurred, a very large landslide on the Fraser River uh, that prevented migration of the largest uh, populations of sockeye salmon. And so if we think about the sockeye salmon or really any salmon uh, life history, and particularly when you, you know, close your eyes and you think about migrations of salmon, you tend to think of, of these adults on the left-hand side of the page. And that's because those are the ones that are, my, that are so visible and they're also contributing to those fisheries. They're the ones that we see on all the nature shows of all the bears um, loving to, to try to fish for salmon. However, for this life cycle to be complete, there's another migration that occurs, and it occurs by a much smaller uh, sized salmon. And this life stage is what we call uh, the smolt life stage. So this is when juveniles leave their natal freshwater lakes 
and migrate hundreds or thousands of miles downstream and out to the open ocean. So this is a very large migration for a very small fish to be taking. And there's some indication that success during this life stage is actually more indicative of population productivity than success during the adult migration. And so myself, as well as a lot of my predecessors, trying to understand what influences the migratory behavior and success of these juvenile sockeye salmon smolts. And so my mentor, Scott Hinch, and his lab began in 2010 studying this particular population of sockeye salmon to try and understand the migration of these little smolts. And this population is located at Chilco Lake, which is denoted by the letter A and the red arrow there on the map. And this is a really good model population to try to understand the, the migration ecology of these fish because it's a huge population. And I'll speak to that in, in a minute. But because it's such a large population, every spring when this migration occurs, the Federal Fisheries Agency called DFO or Fisheries and Oceans Canada, it's kind of the Canadian version of the National Marine Fisheries Service. DFO installs this riverwide counting fence so that they can actually count how many fish move downstream each year to get an idea of how big the population is. And this fence is a really nice platform for researchers like me to get our hands on some fish. Now I alluded to the idea that this is a very large population and I'll admit, I don't know how streaming this video is going to go online. So just bear with me. It's probably going to look very, very choppy. But the idea here is that we are looking downstream through that counting fence and we're going to poke, poke our heads underwater. And hopefully all you can see is just madness, just flashes of fish everywhere. And this is because over about a four week period from mid-April to mid-May, we have between 10 and 70 million of these juvenile fish leave the lake and head downstream. So again, this is a really huge population that represents a huge burst of energy flowing out of this landscape. So how do we study what's going on with these little fish as they migrate downstream? Well, my lab uses a particular technology quite a bit, and that technology is called acoustic telemetry. Now, I apologize that the photo is a Canadian dime, but trust me, an American dime is very similar in size. But what we can do is we can take a, a small electronic tag and we can surgically implant it into a fish, even as small as these uh, juvenile salmon smolts. And this tag actually sends out a unique acoustic signal that we can't hear, but equipment that we can put in the rivers, we can put in the estuaries, we can put out in the ocean can listen for. And so if this fish with a tag swims by this receiver close enough, the receiver will be able to know, okay, fish number 111 was detected at 1210 on today's date. And so we get individual level information on how quickly these fish are migrating downstream. And we can even use uh, statistical models to try to estimate how many fish make it to each point downstream and estimate their survival. So this was the first time that this had been done on wild sockeye salmon smolts. And over about an eight year period, we tagged about 4,000 um, of these juvenile sockeye salmon smolts and tracked their migrations. We tracked their migrations through three river systems and about 400 kilometers through our coastal environment called the Strait of Georgia or the Salish Sea. And in total tracked them for 1,100 kilometers, which is pretty incredible that to tag this little, we're still able to track an animal that far. I'm not going to go into the, any details on this paper, but there was one consistent result that had us a little bit puzzled and that we wanted to investigate further. And that was the idea that in early on in the migration, particularly the Chilco River, survival was consistently poor year after year. This is a beautiful image taken by a, a former graduate student, Steve Healy. This is Chilco Lake on the right, outletting into the Chilco River on the left, going downstream. And what we found is that year after year, the first 14 kilometers of the Chilco River was high risk for these juvenile salmon smolts. And so we wanted to know why. And the first thing that you should note is that that water is just beautiful. It is a beautiful clear and blue. So that water is very clear. And second, the smolts really only move at night. So waters are clear and they only want to move at night. To us, that's an indication that there's predators around that are trying to exploit this migration. And so we started a series of studies on one, part, one predator in particular, and that's the bull trout. 
And so the bull trout is actually technically a char. So that means it's more closely related to things like lake trout and brook trout here out east. Um, but this is a native predator to this system. And what we would notice is we would get to Chilco kind of mid-April to set up all of our gear and everything. And while we were getting prepared, we would notice that there was hundreds of these bull trout sitting in the, in the river in the lake outlet, seemingly waiting for something or preparing for something as well. And so we just simply asked, are the bull trout preparing for the same thing we are? And are they eating the smolts? And if so, how many? And the simple answers to that are yes and quite a few. And so I know it's lunchtime. I apologize for a couple of these images, but this is the stomach contents of a single bull trout. There are 56 sockeye salmon smolts in there. And that is not the record holder. We had uh, some stomachs with evidence of upwards of 100 salmon smolts in their belly. You also notice that these all look pretty fresh. If I didn't tell you they were just pulled out of a stomach, you might expect that we just pulled them out of the river with a net. In fact, some of these fish were so fresh that they tried to swim again after we pulled them out of the bull trout stump. So this indicates that the bull trout are eating at really high rates and that they can ingest a lot of fish really, really quickly. So I'm not going to bore you with all the math and the bioenergetics, but we found that indeed these fish are feeding well beyond what we normally expect them to be able to feed, kind of a phenomenon that that we call binge feeding uh, in the literature. And there's a great article by Matt Miller with the Nature Conservancy on this if, if, you wanna, if you want to learn more about that research. But the message from that work is that these bull trout are eating a lot, even when it was really, really cold. And bull trout are ectotherms, or you might have uh, know it as cold-blooded. Their metabolism should be really low when the water temperature is low. So how do they eat 50 to 100 sockeye salmon smolts in one sitting? That'd be like the equivalent of me eating 10 pounds of hamburgers in a single meal. Well, we think the mechanism is really quite simple. And so I apologize again, if you have a sensitive stomach, you might avert your eyes for the next slide. But this is a stomach that uh, was donated to us by the Honey Gatine First Nation that was dissected out. And what we think is happening is that these fish are just simply using their stomachs as a very flexible storage vessel. Even if it's going to take them days to digest the sockeye salmon smolts, it's still worth eating as many as possible and fitting them into the gut. You can see that this stomach is absolutely stretched to the max. It is stretched so far that hopefully you can see sockeye salmon smolts looking back at you. If you can't, I'll help you out. And so again, these fish don't care how cold it is. They just want to fit as much food into their bellies as possible so they can digest it at a later date potentially. Okay, so if you're a sockeye salmon smolt, this is bad news, right? I mean, you're 600 kilometers, you know, three, 400 miles from even entering the marine environment where there are seals and, and seabirds and all of that. And you've got hundreds of bull trout just waiting for you and trying to shove as many of you into their mouths as possible. So what can the smolts do? How can they maximize their chances of getting through this gauntlet of bull trout? Well, you'll see in this image and then also the previous video is that these animals are schooling together. And one of our oldest hypotheses about the value of, of migrations is that there's safety in numbers or that these migrants can numerically swamp the predators. That, okay, there's a lot of predators there, but if we all go at once and we're in really high density, they can only eat so many of us at once. There's a lot of mathematical and just kind of intuitive support for this hypothesis, but it's really difficult to test that in the field because you need to be able to understand something about the, the density of the population while also tracking the risk of individuals simultaneously. But we were really lucky in that we could do exactly that at Chilco because of this government run counting fence. And hopefully you can see my pointer here on the left hand of the screen. But inside each of these sheds is actually a camera that's mounted looking down. And there's a big tic-tac-toe board under it that the smolts have to swim over. And every five minutes, that camera is taking a photo so you can count how many smolts are on the board. And then there's also a technician inside that shed who's using a stopwatch and clocking. How quickly do the salmon smolts go across that board? And so every five minutes, we have an estimate of how many fish are moving downstream. 
So we have this really high resolution information as to when are a lot of these juvenile salmon going downstream and starting their migration versus times that not many are. And then we can link that with information from the fish that we tagged. And so I promise you, I don't have many data slides. I think this is this little section here is the most intensive data that I show you during this lecture. So just bear with me. In this plot, we're showing you the structure of the outmigration in 2014. On the y-axis, we have the number of fish migrating, starting their migration in a given hour in the thousands throughout time in 2014 when this migration occurred. A couple of take home points. First, this is a really big population. We have hours that there are hundreds of thousands of fish moving through this 100 meter wide river in just a single hour. The second point is that these vertical gray bars are nighttime. And you can see that virtually all of the migration happens at night. Every once in a while we get lucky, there's a little bit of day migration and that's what gives us these beautiful images and videos. But over 99% of these fish start their migration at night. Okay, now each of these circles represents one of our fish that got an acoustic telemetry tag and the corresponding date time that that individual fish started its migration downstream and the corresponding number of friends that it traveled with. And so hopefully what you can see is that some of these points, some of these fish started their migration with hundreds of thousands of friends while other tagged fish went out with very few or even no friends. And so then the question is, did the number of friends these fish travel with influence their chances of getting through this gauntlet? So now we have that same hourly out migration density in thousands on the bottom here. And each of these circles represents a tagged fish, but I'm only showing you the tagged fish that didn't make it. They're the fish that we never detected getting through the gauntlet or anywhere further along the mig migration route. <clears throat> Whoops. Now, each of these circles on the top represents a tagged fish that did make it and the corresponding uh, number of friends that they traveled with. And so hopefully you can see a shift to the right in those dots. But we can also enter this into a, a statistical model that's called a mark recapture model or a Cormac Jolly Sieber model. And we can build this curve that shows the relationship between your, the probability of an animal surviving the gauntlet relative to how many friends did they travel with. So indeed, the more friends you traveled with, the better your chance of getting through this gauntlet of bull trout. And this is what we consider to be one of the better examples of predator swamping um, in the animal migration literature. And we just had another paper that came out uh, a couple months ago that demonstrated that this is a common mechanism that these fish can improve their chances of survival in all six years in which we had uh, data to, to assess this relationship. Okay. So now I think is a good time to kind of come back to these major questions of my research program and try to get a sense of, are we answering them? And so what are the motivations and consequences of, of animal movements? Well, we saw that these smolts can actually synchronize their migration together. They can have a behavioral uh, response to these predators to join together and to swamp predators. I haven't shown you it yet, I will in a little bit, but these bull trout are also moving around to, to optimize their feeding. We see that synch this behavioral synchronization influences the predation. So they, by moving in this way and moving together, they can reduce their individual predation risk. I spared you all of the, the mathematical details, but just this idea of the bull trout using their gut as a storage vessel, even if it's gonna take them days or even a week or more to digest that meal, allows them to consume a lot more than if they were purely just consuming uh, what they could digest in that day. And we also see landscape specific behavior and survival of the smolts. 
And so again, those smolts, this highest risk landscape is this Chilco River. That's this relatively pristine system that we believe has a very healthy number of predators and the waters are clear and slow moving. Once those fish get downstream into more turbid waters, they start traveling day and night and their survival rate is much, much higher. So hopefully that demonstrates how this one system and suite of projects kind of fall into what I kind of consider to be my, my own research framework. However, we're looking for ways to continue to build on this framework within this, within this system. And so I do wanna take a couple of minutes to talk about some ongoing work um, in the system. And the new work in the system kind of flips my original work and its question kind of, kind of in reverse. My PhD and postdoc was focused on those sockeye salmon smolts and trying to understand how do they respond to predation? How can they maximize their chances of surviving a gauntlet? However, by seeing these bull trout aggregate by the hundreds and seeing how much they could feed on these sockeye salmon smolts kind of led us to realize that the salmon are likely really important to these predators too. So this is kind of a two-way relationship that we wanted to investigate in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> and so we're really lucky that Adam Canigan is a PhD student at the University of British Columbia who's continuing this research uh, that was uh, supported by a five-year grant from the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation in British Columbia. And so one of the indicators as to how important are these migrations of the sockeye salmon smolts to bull trout is to ask how far are bull trout willing to move to get to this restriction here at the north end of the lake, right where the lake turns into the river to be able to feed on this buffet. And so Adam is using acoustic telemetry, the same telemetry technology. You can see a couple sutures here if you look closely in that image there, that's a tagged bull trout. And looking at the movements of these fish year after year, and how it relates to the sockeye salmon migration. Again, I apologize if this animation doesn't work very well, but this is just an animation showing the movements of two bull trout throughout this system. Choco Lake is a big lake. You're talking about 50 miles long. And what these bull trout do is they use the entire extent of the lake. So they will literally travel a couple hundred kilometers a year but each April, they actually come back to that location to feed on the sockeye salmon smolts. And we are cherry picking here a little bit. Adam was only able to, to make this animation of a couple bull trout, but we see between about 30 to 50% of our bull trout doing this each year, where they return to this uh, outlet every spring, presumably to feed on these sockeye salmon smolts. And Adam has some really intriguing results. We're not quite to the point where I can share them, um, at least visually, but it appears that bull trout that do this migration to exploit the sockeye salmon smolts um, have a much larger uh, condition. They're much uh, girthier for their length than bull trout that do not take this migration. Okay. So we're about 30 minutes in. We've talked a lot about Chilco Lake in British Columbia, and although we're still highly involved in that work, I do kind of want to spend the rest of the time talking about where else are we working, what other systems, what other types of questions are we answering, to hopefully drive home the point that looking at fish and animal movements is important to understanding their ecology, but then also their conservation and, and management. And so now we're going to look more at what the students in my lab are doing. First, we're going to talk about the, the graduate research of Lars Hammer, who just recently defended and finished his master's last month, as well as Nate Herman. And this is a project that we're working on with Dr. Nigel Hussey at the University of Windsor. And I got to say, I'm, I'm pretty jealous of Lars and Nate because I've been able to work in some pretty fantastic um, and beautiful locations, such as Chilco Lake that I just showed you. And that location is the red dot over here to, uh, to the west. And then obviously we're here in a beautiful area of the continent in New England um, at the University of New Hampshire. But Lars and Nate were able to spend extended time up in the high Canadian Arctic. 
And the specific location that they worked is known as Tremblay Sound in Nunavut, Canada. Now, I'm not as jealous regarding the amenities that they had while living in the high Canadian Arctic. This is their field camp. This is their field site. There, you know, there is no lodging. There are no, there's no bathrooms. There are no running water. Um, and this is where they spent between four and nine weeks, um, depending upon the field season. But this sound is really fascinating and is characteristic of a lot of uh, Arctic sounds and embayments, is that if we had looked at this photo even just weeks or a month earlier, this entire area, including the water, would have been under ice. So in the spring, as you transition from a completely dark winter to a complete, completely light uh, summer, you get a rapid uh, melting of the ice. And as this ice off occurs, there's a lot of critters that are held in the ice. There's algae that grows on the ice. There's a lot of amphipods and other invertebrates that live in the ice. And as that ice breaks up, all those critters get dropped into the water. And that provides a boom of productivity for all of these hungry animals that haven't really eaten much all winter. And so this sound in particular is known for the responses by upper trophic level, high top level predators that come into the system, such as Greenland sharks, as well as narwhal. Now, Lars and Nate weren't studying narwhal and Greenland sharks, but I would argue these species are just as fascinating. And these are sculpins and the migratory Arctic char. And the first questions that we had in this, in this project were just simply, you know, are these fish exploiting this pulse that occurs when that ice melts and, and releases a bunch of stuff? And the answer is, is again, yes. You can see on this image of the sculpin, this looks like a relatively normal sculpin. It has a very characteristic body shape. Um, it doesn't look unhealthy uh, in any way. However, this is what a sculpin looks like when it's been eating during the ice off. And you can see that it looks absolutely more like a softball rather than a fish. And it is because it is so full of amphipods and other little bugs uh, that it's eaten. And we don't see quite as extreme of feeding rates in the Arctic char as we do the sculpin, but they're still eating a whole lot. And so this image, again, I apologize, I know it's lunchtime, but this is the stomach of an Arctic char and it is just completely full of amphipods. Um, which again, you could think of as, as little shrimp-like looking uh, bugs in, in the water. In addition to looking at the stomach contents of these animals, we also used acoustic telemetry to try to understand how are they moving in response to, to this extreme seasonality of these periods of complete ice on versus a rapid ice off and then back to ice on. And I'm going to focus on the Arctic char just simply for, for time. But what Lars found in his analysis that I think is pretty fascinating is that these char are actually entering the sound well before the ice actually comes off. So when these char are not in marine waters, they go into the freshwater environment to, to overwinter. And so I'm going to have an animation that plays through a couple of times that Lars was, was kind enough to uh, um, develop for this talk. But down here at the south is a river system that a lot of the tag char overwinter in. But what we find is that even when the ice is present, the char leave the river and come into to the sound and are distributed throughout almost all of the sound. And that's what we're seeing with the ice present right now. You can see that spaghetti is kind of everywhere before those words turn from ice present into the ice melting period. And what this means is that the char want to be in the sound as early as possible so they can be there as soon as that ice starts to break up and drop down the buffet to them. They want to be spread throughout the, the sound as much as possible. And this is kind of the first time that anyone's been able to demonstrate that these fish aren't necessarily moving with the ice off, but they're actually getting there in preparation for it. Kind of just like those bull trout were sitting at the end of the lake before the migration of the salmon smolts occurred. Okay, so let's take you from somewhere really cold to somewhere really warm. 
Um, I'm also really fortunate to work with a nonprofit group called the Dolphin Biology and Conservation Team, and they're housed out of uh, Italy. And they focus on the movements and, and habitat use and population sizes of, of dolphins in Mediterranean embayments, including um, this small embayment in the Adriatic Sea uh, off of Italy. And what they do is we don't use telemetry um, on these marine animals. Instead, what Silvia uh, Bonazzoni and Giovanni Berzi do is they go out in these small zodiacs with high powered cameras and binoculars, and they simply do transects. And that's what's shown in this middle uh, map here is all these black lines are just them going around in a little zodiac looking for dolphins. There was over 10,000 kilometers of zodiac transects uh, that are shown on that map. And then anytime they come across dolphins, they log it, and then they track the movements of those dolphins. And that's what these red lines are showing. They take images so that they can actually identify each dolphin based on its dorsal fin and get population estimates. But I help them with habitat distribution models to try to understand what type of uh, habitat and water quality characteristics influence where we find dolphins. And last year, we published a, a really interesting paper that demonstrates that dolphins really like to follow fishing boats. And a couple of types of fishing boats in general, these, um, uh, these otter trawlers that's shown here, as well as these what's called a, a pair trawling vessel, where it's actually the net is so large that it's actually towed by two boats. Um, relative to other types of fishing vessels, such as artisanal small scale vessels, as well as beam trawls that weren't really followed and affected the distributions of these dolphins. So we see that even just our actions in the Mediterranean where there is a, a where fishing intensity is very high, there's a lot of uh, overfishing there, is actually affecting the movements and space use of these top level predators. Okay, you're probably getting a little sick of the international flavor here. Nathan, what in the world are you doing closer to home? So let's just take the last five, 10 minutes to talk about these projects. First, we're really lucky to be involved on, on a project that's focused on Jonah crabs. So again, we, we tend to focus on fish, but not everything that, that we tag and track is a fish. And Jonah crabs are becoming an increasingly popular fishery here uh, in the Gulf of Maine. And one of the ideas that's been kind of thrown around in terms of something that could be tried in a fishery is what's called a claw fishery. And that's the idea that we can take the claws from the animal and throw the animal back Hopefully it's alive and hopefully those claws regenerate. And if both of those assumptions are true, then this could be a really sustainable thing. However, claw regeneration and survival after claw removal hadn't really been looked at. And so a, a bunch of my colleagues, uh, Wynn Watson, Joshua Carloni, and Jason Goldstein, um, received uh, funding from New Hampshire Sea Grant to look at exactly those things. If you remove the claws, what happens to them? Um, However, they also wanted to do a, a field component. So that's where my lab comes in and my graduate student, Mo Madre, um, where we're actually taking acoustic telemetry tags, putting them on crabs with their claws and crabs without their claws, and then looking and seeing if their behavior differs. And so Mo is, is slowly working through these, these complex uh, movement data, but we have literally hundreds and thousands of uh, Jonah crab positions for, for her to analyze in a, I'm excited to report on those at a, at a future presentation. Another project that's funded by New Hampshire Sea Grant that's led by Dr. Elizabeth Craig and one of my graduate students, Alia Caldwell is leading also with help uh, from another one of my graduate students, Nate Herman, is looking at links between our local seabirds at the Isles of Shoals and fisheries. With the idea that seabirds are really, really good hunters they can catch little fish much better than we can as scientists. And what they bring back to feed their chicks, can that be indicative of what's available to them uh, in the population? And so I'm going to play this video that shows the movements of terns that were tagged with GPS tags. And I know this is moving very quickly and there's a lot of spaghetti going on here, but all of the blue points and yellow points that you see staying on the map those indicate areas that we think these animals are foraging in. And we do that using statistical models. And they're called hidden Markov models that sound really complicated. But 
in essence, they're really simple. If you were to follow me around in the grocery store, and if I'm like in, let's say, the really healthy aisle that I'm just going to move on straight past because I don't want to eat anything healthy, I'm going to have a very straight, linear, and fast pace to my walk. However, when I get to the ice cream section of the grocery store, I'm going to stop. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to turn this way. I'm going to turn that way. I'm going to go check out the briars several times. And my movement's going to be a lot more tortuous. And these are just simply statistical tools that identify those types of movements within the animal's movement path and says, okay, if you're, if you're slowing down moving and turning a lot more, you're more likely to be foraging. And so what we can see is that these animals have a wide area that they're foraging, but there are some hot spots for sure at the Piscataqua River mouth, um, Great Bay Estuary, as well as some areas in and around the Isles of Shoals. And so these are areas that Alia in her research this summer is going to target and trying to catch fish using traditional fishing metrics as well as some environmental DNA so that we can compare what is available to the terns versus what do they bring back to feed their chicks. Oh, didn't mean to start that again. Another project that we're working on literally right now, just this week, my graduate student Chloe, um, along with uh, Dr. Linus Kenter um, of the Berlinski Lab, we're out um, chatting with local fishers who are fishing on the ice to get our hands on some rainbow smelt. So rainbow smelt, just like the sockeye salmon, are these diadromous or migratory fish that need both marine water and fresh water to complete their life cycle. And we don't have a lot of information as to how long these animals are spending in estuarine environments. So we're using acoustic telemetry as well as some fancy uh, um, chemistry techniques led by Dr. Uh, Benjamin Walther at Texas A&M Corpus Christi to document how long rainbow smelt are in Great Bay and what habitats within Great Bay that they're using. We're also working with Dr. Allison Eberhardt at New Hampshire Sea Grant to get community scientists uh, involved in the sampling in this work. If you're interested in that, reach out. We can get you in touch with uh, Allison and her colleague Wells uh, to get you on the mailing list to, to help out with some of that sample. And then I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to kind of wrap it up here, but we're doing a lot of other work on a lot of other species. Um, we recently received funding from the National Science Foundation to try to understand in the broader Gulf of Maine, not only how are species shifting up our coast as water's warm, but what is that doing to their diet? Because each species is going to shift up or down the coast at a different rate. And that means what you ate before might not be available, but maybe there's some new items on the menu as well. And is that going to be good or bad for your bioenergetics and how much you can grow? So that's a highly quantitative project that, that we're starting this year. Um, there's a nice article on it on UNH Today if you want to read more. Uh, also, the union leader actually just yesterday posted a short article, um, not solely about this work, but kind of a lot of work uh, that's going on at UNH and other um, institutions that are close to us on warming waters in, in the Gulf of Maine. But essentially, if an animal moves, we want to try to study it. And so we've also are doing work on, on Atlantic salmon throughout the state of Maine. Um, I wanted to include this photo because it uh, includes Paul Dest, uh, director um, of the Wells Reserve, just to the north, your partner uh, reserve um, system, where we're doing work using acoustic telemetry on green crabs to try and understand the movements of these invasive species in our estuarine ecosystems. And that's the project that uh, my newest graduate student, Emily Burke, is, is taking on. And so in conclusion, hopefully you can see that animal movements matter. It's a fundamental characteristic of, of life for animals. It influences how they use their, their habitats, what habitats they end up in, how do they interact with predators and, and prey, and whether they survive or not. And understanding these animal movements are going to help us conserve these natural resources. Um, oftentimes, for us to implement proper management practices, we need to know something about these animals' movements. And I use telemetry a lot, and I love it. I think it's really, really powerful. But I think when we can integrate telemetry data with other types of data, whether it's you know the counting fence data, or whether it's stomach samples, or sampling of the prey fields, that's when we really start to understand something about these species ecology. 
And so with that, I think we have about 14 minutes left for questions. So I just wanna say thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with all of you. My email is there at the bottom. Don't ever be afraid to, uh, to reach out and I'll uh, answer any questions that I can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nathan, that was great. Um, yeah, so I think everything's gone pretty smoothly. So if you prefer, you can type your questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask the question that should be fine too. Definitely. So Anna has a has a wonderful question. I'll read it out in case um, uh, in case folks aren't able to, to access the chat. So if a salmon smolt was tagged, but doesn't make it, how do you know the telemetry data doesn't transmit from the predators that eat the smolt? That's a great question. And in fact, we don't. And so it's entirely plausible that an animal, um, we have a tagged smolt and then a bull trout could eat that tagged smolt. For a while, we would then detect the bull trout and assume it's a smolt. This doesn't impact our work too much because of how far the salmon smolts are migrating and the bull trout aren't migrating that far and neither are any of the other predators in the system. And so for example, if a bull trout ate a smolt in the Chilco River, we might incorrectly say that it survived that first 14 kilometers, but then we would see it not show up at the next site further down. And also that tag is going to stay in the predator for a lot shorter of a time than it will in the animal that we tag. Because in the animal that we tag, we put it into to the body cavity directly, surgically. However, if a predator ingests it, it is going to digest all of that prey item. And for a lack of a better word, it's gonna eventually poop that tag out. It will eventually sink to the bottom. And so it's not gonna move around any further and eventually get covered over. I didn't show you these data, but we have some fine scale uh, movement data on the juvenile salmon as well as the bull trout. So actually trying to identify a position to a few square meters. Um, and we can see in some of those patterns that, yep, it looks like maybe here a smolt turned into a bull trout. Um, we also have to deal with this in the coastal environment with things like seals, but seals are endothermic or warm blooded. So they tend to digest it very, very quickly and poop it out really quickly. Um, and then we don't have it. And then the second question that Anna had was what happens to the tags and juveniles that do survive? And the answer is quite simply that the tag stays, stays in the animal's body. Um, so we are using sutures and those sutures dissolve, but the idea is that the sutures are dissolving as the animal heals. And so they just get this kind of internal backpack um, in their body uh, for, for their life. And so you can kind of think of this, you know, obviously the burden's a little bit bigger, but kind of your dog, a lot of, uh, a lot of animals have a, what's called a passive integrative transponder tag that's surgically implanted into them. Hopefully as the animal continues to feed and get larger and larger and larger, that burden from the tag gets less and less. Uh, so Steve Jury asked, um, with the bull trout predation, did you also see bird predation? And if so, how did you account for these tags lost from the system? So that's a great point, Steve. We do see bird predation. What's really neat about the bird predation at Chilco Lake is how variable it is. It seems really opportunistic in that each year, the bull trout are there. They're ready, they're keyed into this. We would always see birds there, but it was always in different numbers and it was different species. So there was a couple of years where it was loons, where you had 20, 30 loons that were just prowling the water and just going crazy for these, uh, for these fish. Other times it was uh, gulls, like Bonaparte gulls. There'd be times there'd be a couple hundred Bonaparte gulls. At night, sometimes there would be bats. How does this influence our modeling? Well, when it comes to the survival modeling, we should actually be able to incorporate that in terms of a survival estimate, because for an animal to can be considered to have survived getting to a point downstream, it needs to be detected downstream. And so it doesn't matter if it's a bull trout that eats it and prevents it from going downstream, or if a bird actually takes that animal out of the system where our receivers couldn't even hear it. As long as that animal is predated on, it won't be heard downstream. It won't get to that gate. That will be entered in as essentially a mortality 
um, or presumed mortality, apparent mortality into, into our model. So hopefully that answers your question, Steve. Uh, Richard, rainbow smelt were mentioned, but are there any other interesting species moving in and out of Great Bay? Absolutely. Um, and this is something that uh, uh, we're working on all the time. How do we tag and, and track more critters um, going in and out of Great Bay? And so one of the ones that's at the top of my mind are river herring. And so river herring are actually a complex of two species that are really hard to tell apart in the field. And those are blueback herring and alewife. And so just like salmon and just like rainbow smelt, these are species that require migrating from the marine environment moving upstream into freshwater to, to spawn to, uh, to complete their life, life cycle. And so these are species that have been dramatically impacted by dams, potentially even more so than rainbow smelt that tend to, they still move into freshish water, but they tend to spawn kind of at the head of tide. So they don't have to get quite as far upstream as let's say river herring that need to get into pure fresh water to, to spawn. So we're working on a proposal uh, that's literally due uh, tomorrow to try to propose looking at some movements of uh, river herring uh, in Great Bay. Um, and those are just some examples. We have a lot of migratory fish um, in, in Great Bay. Thinks of, think of things like American uh, eel. We, we get some sturgeon that come on down from, from Maine into our system uh, as well. We have lamprey. Um, Etc. And then even non-migratory fish in Great Bay that are really important fish, things like smooth flounder that are generally considered an indicator of estuarine health because they're pretty sensitive to water quality, winter flounder that's an important fish, and then obvious really important game fish, things like striped bass uh, and bluefish that, that people like to catch. And then Nancy, I'm not sure, I don't think all of your question came in. It just says, great topic, great speaker. Thank you so much. I'm happy to read that out loud. And then what kind of population of adult something? And so Nancy, if you're able to, to hear me and get back to us on that question, I'd be happy to, to answer that question as well. Hey, Nathan, this is Chris Peter. I, it looks like Nancy's away from her computer. Um, great. I'm gonna jump in with a question though at this opportunistic moment. <clears throat> Great talk. Thanks for presenting. Um, I had, I, I definitely binge eat a lot too at the end of November every year when there's a lot of free available food, so I can definitely relate. Um, it looks like you've been tracking, you know, seasonal patterns of certain species, you know, especially in Chocoa Lake with, with decades long of data. Have you noticed any phenology shifts potentially related to climate change of that data set? Yeah, and that's something, to be honest, Chris, we haven't dove into, but it's a question that, that we have, and it's one that Scott and I, Scott Hinch at University of British Columbia, um, and I kind of keep in the back of our minds for another master's project, um, if, as if we, we need more students in, in our labs, um, but that we do have information, this high resolution information as to when are those fish leaving the lake, and there's a lot of variability to it, and so if you Think back to my plot on the dynamics of the 2014 outmigration. It was actually kind of, there was two humps to it. So there are a lot of fish left kind of that third week of April. And then we had a week that there was very little fish out migrating and then another big pulse. And we want to know why does that happen? Because every year it just looks a little bit different, but there's usually two to three pulses. And so we're curious if it is things like uh, uh, over long periods of time, could that shift with uh, let's say decreases in snowpack or warming waters, um, more rapid snow melt. But then even within a season, kind of why do we get these pulses? Does it have something to do with moon cover? Um, does it have to do with water flow or water temperature? We haven't seen any kind of overall shifts in terms of like fish going out sooner or later with time. But one of the things that we did see was in 2015 was a very um, dramatic year meteorologically, meteorologically, um, even people with PhDs can't talk, um, in British Columbia, where there, the snowpack never got to where, to where it was, because there wasn't a lot of snow and there's a lot more rain. And so the river never got down as low as it should have. And so instead of it being that blue 
clear water, it was a lot more turbid and the water was a lot higher even when we got there in mid-April to the point that the Federal Fisheries Agency could not install that fence. The water was too deep and too swift moving, which meant for the first time in 70 years, they could not monitor the outmigration of those fish. And it was a kind of a one-off, but again, it was, it was um, weather patterns that we kind of expect to become more and more common with climate change. And so that kind of forced DFO to think about more carefully in the future, how do we monitor this population if we can't get a fence in? Great, thanks, Nathan. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> okay, Steve. Steve asks, random question, can dolphins hear acoustically tagged fish? And if so, are they attracted to them? I'm, I can't speak particularly to dolphins, but I'll just speak to marine mammals in general, Steve, because this, this is a great question. And this is actually known as uh, what's called the dinner bell hypothesis. So can we train marine mammals to hear the animals that we tagged as a dinner bell and have them come running? Absolutely, we can train animals to do that. And so this was done at uh, some, some aquariums out west where they took seals um, and sea lions on exhibit. They actually tagged some of their prey and kind of taught them that, hey, if you hear a ping, you should go eat that. So, uh, so marine mammals can definitely hear. I can't speak to dolphins, but I know seals and sea lions, phocids, um, can definitely hear the frequency of acoustic tags that we put out. The broader question then is, is could they actually learn that in a natural system? And so we tagged about 4,000 of these fish over a decade, anywhere between 100 and 600 fish a year. Even if you had 10 other researchers that were doing that all at the same time, if you think about the tens of millions of fish leaving this lake and the hundreds of millions of fish leaving the Fraser River estuary and going out into the coast, it still seems like a bit of a needle in the haystack where maybe you kind of hear it once or twice. And you're like, ooh, that sounds cool. And then you realize it's a fish, but then you couldn't actually find any more. Um, as well as, I don't know if I would like having a tag that I can hear pinging inside of me every one to two minutes after I've eaten it. So then there's the question of, okay, if they learn to eat it, do they actually still want to eat it? And so I think there'd be a lot of opportunities to kind of play with some mathematical models, some simulation models to kind of test these different hypotheses. How many tags would you need? How many encounters would you need with marine mammals to the point that it actually started affecting our, our study design? So absolutely, they can hear them. I'm not as concerned about that influencing our results as just some of our more classic concerns in terms of things like tag burden and tagging effects. But that's a great question, Steve. Any other questions? Seems like we've got about one more minute. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. I really enjoyed having this opportunity. I, I hope you enjoyed it. And don't be afraid to, to reach out, shoot an email, or, or you can find me on Twitter as, as well, nbfuries, uh, my handle. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Nathan.